Well, hello again, and welcome along to the Irish Connection Country Show. I'm your host, Sean Green, and on today's show, which is a very special show because we're celebrating our very first anniversary, we've got some very, very special guests. We're going to be meeting a gentleman who was born and raised in Devon, but now calls Germany his home. That is singer-songwriter Sean Harvey. We're also going to be going down to County Down to meet up with a gentleman who recently recorded an album with Pete Anderson, the gentleman that's responsible for the sound that you hear from country star Dwight Yoakam, and his name is Tom Keenan. But to uh, kick things off, we're going to add a little bit of glamour to the show and welcome along a lady from Fambana, and that is Kathy McGovern. Kathy, you're very, very welcome along to the show. Thank you very much for having me, Sean. It's good and to be here. You're looking very well indeed, may I say? Thank you. <laughs> now listen, you're from Fambana. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I mean, how did the music bug bite you? Um, well, I suppose music kind of bit me a little later in, later in life than a lot of people. Um, I studied and went to college, moved to Dublin, had the party times there, you know, yourself, <laughs> and uh, decided to move home and then really um, looked at a career in music then at that stage. Um, it was initially to fund college that I went out on my own as a one piece, um, got bit by the bug, so then it kind of, the music kind of overtook the college work in the end. So. Um, Basically, from then, I've just uh, hopefully t tried out different types of music, but I've settled mainly in the country genre. So, And you're very happy because listening to your albums, and I, I mean, you sound very relaxed with that particular style of music. Yeah, I love country. Um, it probably comes a lot because I love dancing. I love, I love getting out to the dances, jiving, waltzing, all that sort of stuff. So um, I always had an idea of a few songs that I would like to do if I did uh, record an album. So when I did get to the stage of recording, I had a few ideas of, you know, up my sleeve what I wanted to do. And who were some of the major influences on you when you were first getting into the country market? Um, well, I would have grown up probably listening to um, not so much Irish country, more American country, um, the likes of Nancy Griffiths, um, Emmy Lou Harris, Dawn Williams. So a lot of people would, would have the same influences in music, but they would have been kind of the main ones that I would have you know, listen to growing up. And what is, what's your opinion of the new style of country that's currently coming through through the airwaves of the radio stations at the moment from America? Well, a lot of people would argue that it's not strictly country, but things progress on in different ways. So there's something for everybody, I think. Um, the new area of country, as I say, is coming in, maybe has a more poppy feel to it. But I think that is filtering its way down as well to maybe the dance floors in Ireland at the minute. Yeah. So, which is not a bad thing because it's getting the young people back on the country scene from our perspective is that we can um, maybe turn a good pop tune into a, a good jive, it can't be bad. Right. Now, I mean, you've got, uh, as I said before, a seven track album out, which as I said, this is it. I mean, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, tell us about the recording of it because obviously you've never been into a recording studio before you recorded that. So what was it like for you as a young girl getting thrust into such a big environment? Well, the first uh, one was a seven track I did. Um, Really, that was I wanted to go up to the Lambus Fair. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> so I wanted something to sell. So I had my stall. So there was no point having a stall without something to sell. Right. So that was initial for the seven track. Why I did that? Um, picked just a few songs that I have sang, you know, on my one piece around the country and stuff. So that one was um, a bit of a taster into what. And then we went forward then and did the, the full 14 track CD. That was the, really the hard slog. Now that took. Did you find a long that time. it was an enjoyable process or did you find that? You know, as I said, you found it very difficult. I well, I loved it, but it was quite difficult. As in, not coming from a particularly musical background, I can strum a bit of guitar, nothing to. I wouldn't pull it out and show anybody. Put it that way. Right. <laughs> a bit. I'd play a bit of the guitar, and um, it would even be, be the jargon of you know in the recording studio of uh, what you know getting across what you want because I was uh, very actively involved in the whole process. It wasn't a case that I went in and said I want this song went away and came back six months later it was done. I was every part along the way I was involved in. Do you find it's important when an artist is recording music that they have a, a full on effect in it in this respect that they pick the songs that they like? Or do you like it when somebody suggests songs that you should record? Well, I, I'm always open to suggestions, definitely, because and some of the tracks on this, both CDs have been suggested by actually mo a good few of them suggested by dancers. But so it always be keen, especially when recording the 14 track, is to have it something that people could play, you know, at a party or you know when you, if you're you know going to a dance that they'll ask for it, 
you know, so it's not something that maybe you record and then they never hear you ever play. I think it's important that they continue on, that whatever you record on your CD, you should be heard live playing as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is another question I was going to put to you. Do you f think that it's also important when somebody records an album that they should sound like that when they go out live? Oh, definitely, yeah. I mean, you've recently now were telling me um, about this band that you've just put on the road. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's early days yet. Um, it's um, guys I met kind of on the scene doing um, spots and concerts, that sort of thing. They would be, um, I've done a few nights with them and then they asked me to do um, a few bigger nights um, recently. And uh, then we just got the opportunity to do a night with the band, which before I wouldn't have had much, well, I would have been maybe offered you know, gigs like that, but wouldn't have had a band to, you know, to really go ahead. So they've been really good to me, the guys, and they're all professional musicians in their own right, and they tour and work with other musicians as well. So at this stage, they're not, they're the Kathy McGovern band when I, you know, when I want them to be, but yeah. they could be 10 other different things at the same time. But it's early days, it is great fun. Now you've working. also, you've done two things. You've appeared with a band, you've played with a band, and also you do your own solo show. I mean, tell us a little bit the big difference between when you do your solo show and when you're out in front with a band behind you. I mean, which do you actually prefer? Well, the band every day, every time, the band. Um, it's, uh, I think, I love, you know, my own one piece show. I know my gears, my, all my own equipment. I know where I am. I know what comes next. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. I can probably, you know, the, the flow of that for me is at this stage, you know what I mean? I know what inside out. So, and, uh, and people know what they, what they get and I can change and chop and change um, literally on an instant. If, if a young crowd come in, I could cater for them straight away. It's a little more difficult with the band. Obviously you have to have your set lists and everything else. But we have worked out a good wee set. But the band, any day, like sure, the feel of being behind a band and the banter, the company, if nothing else, as it's well. It's better than being up on the stage on your yeah, own, isn't it? Yeah, and then you can put your own style and you can say, right, to the lads, I want this song and I want it done faster, I want it done slower, I want it done to a, do you know, maybe to a funkier beat or, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? Oh, you can awesome, awesome. chop and change things up, which is just something you can't do with your tracks, I'm afraid. You okay, you recently crossed over to the DVD field and we're going to be seeing you from one of your DVDs in a few minutes. Tell us a little bit about what was it like for you as a young artist to be thrust into that field, making a DVD for a song that you've recorded? Well, I thought it was great fun. Really did enjoy it. Um, it was nice with friends of mine who did record the DVD with me, so it wasn't too alien. We messed around, we had a bit of fun with it. Um, it was also recorded at the back of my house, my own house, so we had, I think the night before, until about one o'clock, setting up the scene in the barn. So it was good fun in that, and then I think, as you see, my own horse plays a key role in the video. <laughs> so she um, definitely made herself known, but well, she was only supposed to be in the background, but she became a very much big the part. Star. The star of the show, never mind me. She's like, she's the one that people ask about all the time. It doesn't matter about me, it's all about her. <laughs> and, uh, and now you've done this, I mean, has this swept your appetite to do more DVDs in the future for songs that you do? Yeah, well, we've actually got four DVDs done. Um, the other three just haven't released yet. They're all ready to go. But um, we're just, um, as I say, getting the opportunity to get them filtered out in the right way. They're all ready to go, but just to pick in the right time to launch them. <laughs> well, thank you once again, Cathy, for uh, being our guest here on our first anniversary show. And of course, thank you very much, Eddie, for coming in and seeing us. I hope you enjoyed it. I did enjoy it, Shirley, and thank you for having me, Sean. Any time. And as I said before, we're now going to see one of Cathy's DVDs, which comes from her seven-track album. This is Cathy McGovern and Suds in the Bucket. <laughs>
when a prince pulled up a white pickup truck, plenty old enough, and he can't stop love, no he can't stand time, and he can't stop That was uh, my very first guest, Cathy McGovern, one of her DVDs and a track from her called Suds in the Bucket. Now, my second guest is a German who was born and raised in Devon, but soon moved over to Germany where he is relocated at the moment. And that is my second guest, Sean Harvey. Sean, welcome along to the show and thank you for traveling all this way to see us. <laughs> nice to meet you, Sean. It's really good. I know. Listen, tell us a little bit about Sean Harvey because you're an unknown name over this particular part of the world. I mean, tell us what it all happen for you yeah well actually um uh in uh, in uh, in germany and that like uh, and in england uh, i've always kicked around quite a long time you know as, as sort of solo and then uh, as partly with my old band as well and uh, but uh, recently i you know it's been uh, it's been going a little bit better with the b57s the new group that i have uh, based in germany and uh, I, I, I kind of get more shows over uh, England, Netherlands, and I, I thought, you know, it'd be nice to come over to Ireland as well for some of the fa but fans. Be, like, as I said at the beginning, you originally were raised and born in Devon. What made you want to move over to Germany? Uh, well, my, not that there's any yeah, harm in of course Germany. Not. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, actually, the, um, my wife was born in, in Germany, so uh, it was kind of logical progression, really, to sort of go over, over to there. Europe, yeah, because... Um, what it was, I had a lot of friends over over in uh, in Europe, so um, I was travelling a lot, obviously, to Germany and coming back to England, going to Germany, England, uh, Netherlands, Belgium, you know, wherever. So I thought, uh, as my my wife was from Germany, I thought, oh, well, why not just go over to the other side and commute back to England? <laughs> Something <laughs> now like you're that. a singer songwriter. You play guitar. Tell us how that came into your life. I mean, is it self-taught you are, or did you actually study the guitar in school or college? No, I'm completely uh, uh, Sean. I'm really completely self-taught. Uh, what it was, I blame my mum and dad really, because when I was about 13, uh, my dad bought me my first acoustic guitar, and then I decided. Um, to get a good uh, reverb or something like that, I put it onto the, uh, put it in the toilet, <laughs> put the, some electric strings on it, and uh, I used to get the good reverb, you know, the the, the whole echo, you, what you get like from the old rock and roll records, you know. So um, I used to sit in there for maybe one to two hours, folks banging on the door, <laughs> sort of, can you get come out in a minute, Sean, you know? So I'd sit in there for. I was on end learning the guitar. So I'm actually self-taught, really, you know. I, and when did the uh, songwriting come into your life? Uh, I was, I kind of around, uh, I think, first of all, I started learning the guitar for about two, three years, uh, getting sore fingers and stuff like that. And then uh, I wrote my first song, actually. Uh, I got an old tape recorder, and I thought, well, I can play a few chords now, so I tried to learn to write a song. So I wrote down a few words, you know, and then I started singing it. I thought, ah, oh, that's how you write a song, really. So it was about maybe 14 or 15, the very first untuneful tune you know and who were some of the major influences in your life as a musician well kind of um when i grew up i listened to a lot of uh, uh obviously i was born in the 70s so i actually heard the 70s quite a lot but my real influences like chuck berry dave edmonds uh, little richard you know nice. um, heavily influenced by the rock and roll era really the rock and roll era but then i also like to listen later on to the country music the blues music, mm -hmm. and also even a little bit like ZZ Top and Billy Idol and stuff like this, you know? And do you try and make all those influences come out in the music that you write as a singer-songwriter? Yeah, it kind of, it's all in there, and it, and it kind of, um, really, because I, I sort of taught myself, I think it sort of came out just individual, a little bit, it's a little bit rock, a little bit blues, a little bit country, you know, it's all in there. And I think all those influences from uh, what I hear, uh, like from Dave Emmons records and uh, stuff like that, it's all in there, you know. So you like you, you like the raw sound, like, because I Dave do. Edmonds had a very raw Rootsy sound. Rootsy music, Rootsy, yeah. yeah. I always like the Roots music, whether it's uh, uh, traditional country even, you know, like uh, uh, with like acoustic guitars and uh, stuff like, uh, say, uh, Bill Monroe, the bluegrass stuff, you know. Or uh, like the Albert Lee, who I work with, you know, it's very traditional country. And, um, yeah, I, I love it, you know, that anything that is real music is the best thing, I think. I mean, when you're at home in Germany, and you, as you said, you do a lot of shows in Germany, yeah. the Netherlands, places like that. I mean, what sort of venues are you as an artist playing? It varies, really. I mean, like, myself, personally, as a musician, 
Um, I'm quite happy to play for a private birthday party of, say, my friends to a hall, you know, to a venue, to a proper right. stage. Uh, like next year, we do the uh, the Americana Festival, which, which is, is in nice Nottingham, yeah. Minute, Sean. And that's uh, that's the big one with I don't know so many thousand people or something. Isn't and it? you're bringing your full band over yeah, for that. Yeah, a full well. band over there. I have a new sax player, new piano player. Bo he plays good boogie woogie, you know. And uh, I'm thinking of there might be a guest musician coming from Nashville. And uh, there might be a few surprises for who might be on the stage. Now, talking of the brass, because you said you've got a sax player now, I mean, do you find that you prefer the brass sound? Because in a lot of records nowadays that are coming out, the brass is coming back to the fore again, whereas for a few years yeah, it yeah. was very dolent. It, yeah, yeah. it was forgotten it was about, away, swept under it? the yeah, yeah. carpet. I mean, what do you think about that? Do you think it's important to have brass in records? Actually, I've always liked it personally, because I like Little Richard and stuff like this. You know, it's always a nice, heavy brass influence, you know? and. Um, you're right, actually, Sean. Come to think about it, the 80s was predominantly full with like Tina Turner's records or whatever. They always had a lovely saxophone section, like Bruce Springsteen with Clarence Clemens, you know. And um, I like it for rock and roll. I think it's very good. But I also like playing it with just the guitars, you know. It's, I'm, you know, if it's Buddy Holly star, it's lovely, isn't it? But I like, I do like the full sound because it gives me the. Uh, rock and roll edge you know it gives me that drive to uh, that's that was it. what i was going to ask you as well i mean you do solo shows and you work with your band i mean how do you switch you mean how do you sell do you turn yourself over from sort of being doing a solo show to working with a full band like you like your own band which you currently work with yeah, yeah. um well really i i kind of i prefer uh, uh, with a band actually because like rock and roll is always about dancing and mm -hmm. you know moving and and, uh, and portraying it getting across to the audience uh, a good uh, a good vibe have, you know having a nice time and uh, and really uh, rocking it up at the venue you know <laughs> so when I'm by myself with one guitar I feel like I could give uh, even more of a rocky uh, performance with the band you know but uh, I do like play everybody likes me playing the acoustic you know when I play at my folks or uh, you know my dad likes it on the acoustic so back down to the roots level is nice too yeah. isn't it but yeah. for me now you I think you can't beat somebody doing a number just on, on a guitar song. because it shows you exactly how that song came into being that's right, that's how it was portrayed how yeah. it was written how it first got its life and then, of course, obviously, you later on, you add the, the rest of, of the band in. But it's lovely. I always think that. I mean, is that how you find it when, when you do a song? I mean, do you like to try it out on one of your solo shows before you actually bring it to the band to try? Yeah, obviously, when I, when I write a new song, Sean, uh, um, it's strange, the songwriting process, actually, because everybody always says, how do you get a song, you know? Mm. And how do you... How do you um, uh, how, where does it come from? Really, it comes from just up in the sky. You know, it's like uh, you could be sitting on a train and you get some ideas for words, or you get a melody in your head, and then you think, you know, or you've got your guitar with you, of course, and you play maybe a G chord or E minor or something. That's often how I get a song. Sometimes I get the chord structure, then I think, ah, I'll put some words to that and, you know, make it into a tune. So I agree, it's nice when you start with the roots of how a song comes about before the production. When you write a new song, do you like to try it on your audience before you actually go ahead and oh, record yeah, it? Oh, yeah, they're guinea pigs all the time, you know. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's course, you know. It's like, yeah. Sometimes I say to the band, that's the funny thing, when, when I play with the band, um, I, we have a set list, you know, of course, like all bands, you know. But I'm very much like Chuck Berry, I play what I feel on, on the night. So if the audience are having a good time and want it a little bit more rocky, then you give them something rocky. Right. If they want it a bit smoochy, you know, for a little cuddle or whatever, then I slow it down to something. You know, so the band have always got to be on the a little on bit the on toes. the edge. Yeah. On the toes. Yeah, now you've a got a new really. album, which, as I said, you've uh, got out called Think It Over. Tell us about the recording of this particular album. Where was it done? Well, actually, some was done with a. Uh, uh, it's been done in two places actually. Um, one was done. Some tracks were done with um, Morrissey's guitarist, Boz Bora, who also played for the Polecats, the old rockabilly band, the Polecats. Right. Yes. Yeah. And uh, then he went on with Morrissey later, and he's become his main producer and he's also produced like David Bowie or whatever and uh, the other guy on it actually was kind of in a way one of my not idols directly but from an idols band he was actually the bass player for uh, Dave Edmonds band rock pile yeah rock pile and also um, he's from love sculpture it's John David who also worked with Cole Perkins on the rockabilly session actually so in a way it's kind of like a indirect hero in it in some mm, ways yeah. and he also produced status quo and that and that was over in the forest of dean so uh so we had some recordings in the forest of dean 
and some down in Portugal. Right. That's well, a bit of a... Um, now, pick. the songs that you got on it, I mean, did it take a long time to get all those songs written for the album, or were they already written before you thought about yeah, the album? Yeah, th this, this particular album is kind of like... Um, actually, there's one or two tracks as a bonus with Albert Lee that I did from the Albert Lee session that I put on for the fans, because I thought, you know, right. we'd done an album before with Albert, but I thought they fit nice with this album too. So there's a couple of tracks on there with Albert Lee as well from yeah. another session. <laughs> so it's kind of like a mix, but I mean, it's... Uh, the thing is, it takes me very quick to write a song, but I, I'm a bit longer to think about what I might put on an album, you know. Right. I mean, you know, I, I, I think I wrote on, to, on the whole... I've lost count, but, you know, it must be over 500 songs or so. So some of these are old songs, some are new, and I revamped them. And what about the rep recording process? Did, it take, did that take very long? Because I'm always uh, amazed. Sometimes people can say, well, we went in, we done it in two days. Other people say, well, when it took us two weeks. Other people yeah. can say, well, it took four months. I mean, what... With Sean Harvey, how long did this particular album take to get it's, all it's done all and dusted, as it's they say? It's all recorded live. Yeah. And then just tra overdubbed a few, you know, if you've got like an old bit where you think the guitar would be better. Um, it actually took me for uh, not very long at all. It's normally I go in for a day or a couple of days and mm -hmm. that's it, really. And do you find that if that happens, that it goes quickly and you get it all done and dusted quickly, you find it comes out as a better sounding album than something yeah. to say that you have to stop, start, yeah, stop, yeah. start? Yeah, if you're thinking too much of the production, I think, then you're going to lose that feel of the rock and roll feel, you know, because all rock and roll was very live music. Of course, know? of course. Of course. And, and obviously you've got to record rock and roll in the studio, Sean. But uh, you don't want to lose that energy of the performance, do you? Because, you know, it's a spontaneous music, isn't it? It's did you have all the musicians in the studio with you when you were recording it, or did you do um, everything individually? Um, no, we recorded it all together as such. And then, like, uh, say, it, when, for instance, the tracks with Albert, Albert Lee was sitting next to me on the couch. He's not there today, of course. <laughs> but, you know, we bring him next time, isn't it, Sean? Yeah. You know? But he was sitting, sitting there next to me, and we were all DI'd a little bit into the uh, mixing desk, you know, in, in, the, in the mixing room. And then the drummer was in his sound booth. And, uh, yeah, Silka was next to me here on the bass. You know, she played the bass. I was rhythm guitar, and uh, Albert was on his lead guitar. So we just... Did it was one it? take. And the same with Boz in Portugal was done all together. live as such. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Cause of course, just for the people that don't know, Silky, who is your wife? I mean, plays yeah. bass guitar, doesn't she? Of course, yeah, my, my very missus. Music, uh, very musical family. I mean, you must have really. some great nights when it gets dark and yeah, lonely and it's yeah. nothing to do. <laughs> you mean like flying from the airport? Of sure. course, yeah. yeah. Of course, yeah, yeah. But it must yeah, be but great nice. when the two of you are, you know, both musically inclined, that you can sit down and you yeah, can throw ideas yeah. at each other. I mean, often we just uh, sit down in the, in the flat or something and I say, see, obviously, like I say to Silky, I have a new song. And then I start playing it, don't I? And then I, I often say to her, what bass line do you think will fit to that? Or maybe sometimes I think of a bass line and then she'll, and then she'll play do her it. own thing with it, you know? So it's kind of nice, Sean, isn't it? And it's great. Yeah. Well, listen, it's been uh, absolutely amazing to me. Uh, thank you so much, Adi, for Sean, you know? taking the time and the trouble to fly in from Germany to oh, be on the show nice today. To I really you know, appreciate it. it really nice, thank you. you know? no, no problem. And now we're going to have some uh, music from Sean Harvey, who you heard me talking to just then. It's the Tal Band from his new album. This is Sean Harvey playing live here and a track called Think It Over. I was singing it over About the things you said It was sticking in my brain now Like toasted bread It didn't dawn on me It didn't mean a thing Until I fought it over about the things you said now Ooh, about the things you said Ooh, about the things you said now Ooh, about the things you said now I was singing it over About the things you said It was ticking in my brain now like toasted bread It didn't dawn on me It didn't mean a thing Until I phoned it over About the things you said now Ooh, about the things you said Ooh, about the things you said Ooh, about the things you said now Singing it over 
I bet the fame she said It's taking in my brain now Like toasty bread It didn't dawn on me It didn't mean a thing Until the phone ain't over I bet the fame she said now in here. That's my uh, second guest here on the show today, a gentleman from uh, Germany called Sean Harvey, and a track from his new album, a little thing called Think It Over. And my final guest on today's show is a gentleman that comes from County Down. He's a singer-songwriter, and that is Tom Keenan. Tom, welcome to the show. Hello, Sean. Thanks for having me. Now, uh, again, a gentleman that we don't know an awful lot about over this particular part of the world. So tell us a little bit about the history of Tom Keenan. Well, I've been playing music from the age of 16, and uh, just you know, playing around hotels, bars, clubs, that sort of thing. Because, of course, for a while, I mean, you were originally over here and then you moved across to Manchester for a while, didn't you? Yeah, I was born here in Ireland and my family moved to the northwest of England when I was 11. And I stayed over there for about 12 years before returning home. Right, and then, of course, like, you've settled down now and counted down. I mean, tell us a little bit about the uh, singer-songwriter aspect of your life. I mean, when was it that you decided that you wanted to be an entertainer, that you wanted to show people exactly what you could do with words and music? Uh, I started my first band with a school friend. It was just for our own enjoyment, and we started to do gigs and get gigs and get into it that way. Mm -hmm. And how did this songwriting come, come along? Uh, I've always written songs. As soon as, you know, when I got my first guitar, I started to write songs. Uh, but I've never really released them or done anything with them. Mm. I mean, how did you get your influences? I mean, because everybody, no matter who they are, whatever singer, songwriter there is, everybody has a different way of finding the ideas that they put down on words that become a song. Yeah. Uh, I've always been, you know, a big music fan. And I listen to all sorts of music and all types of artists, you know, so that's... I mean, have you found that... To other artists are ones that have influenced you. Like, give us an idea who some of the artists that have influenced Tom Keenan in his songwriting and his playing. Uh, people like Guy Clark, Merle Haggard, Willie Nelson, uh, Rodney Crowell, people like that. Do you find as a, a songwriter that those artists that you have just mentioned, do you find that you listen to them maybe a little more closer than the average music listener? Yeah, well, I, I always tend to be interested in the lyrics of a song. You know, that's. It's got to have some. It's got to say something to me. Uh, I'm not necessarily a fan of just catchy tunes. You know, there's got to be some some depth in a song, and those sorts of writers write great songs, story songs, and what have you. I mean, story songs that you have written yourself. I mean, tell us. I mean, when you are out and about, are you always looking or listening around to see if you can get a hook, a line, a title for a a song that you might write in the future? Yeah, if I hear something, you know, I'll. I'll make a mental note of it, you know, in day-to-day -day life you always come across things that, you know, inspire you to write a song. Mm. Now you write, uh, as I said, songs and you also play guitar. Tell us about the guitar playing. How long has that been in your life? I started playing guitar when I was about 14 or so. Did you study at school, college or no, did you, you self-taught yourself? Yeah, I never had any musical lessons. Why pick the guitar? Uh, I was actually given a guitar. An uncle of mine gave me a guitar. So I just started to play around with it. Mm -hmm. And did you ever think that one day it would be your source of income? Uh, I don't know. I never really thought it would be, no, to be honest. Mm -hmm. But I left college and I was doing lots of gigs and I've just, you know, continued to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Now, you've recently been across to America, which I want you to relate the story about how this new album, which you've got out, which is called The Devil's Playground. Uh, tell us a little bit how that came into being, because you've got in touch with a really famous record producer. Now, tell us the story behind this. Yeah, uh, I've always been threatening to make an album, and if you'd asked me who would have liked to produce my album, Dream Producer, I would have said Pete Anderson. I have a friend who lives in Hollywood, and he happened to run across Pete Anderson and got talking, said my friend is a singer-songwriter, you know. Anyway, Pete gave him a, an email address and he said, get your friend to send me some of his stuff. So I emailed him a couple of tracks, you know, and I thought that would be the end of it. Didn't expect to hear anything more. The next thing I got a call from Pete, you know, he said, I, I like your songs, I like your music, could you come over? And I said, of course I can come over. So I flew over and, and we made the album. Right. Now, working with Pete Anderson, I mean, as I explained at the beginning of the show, of course, he's known for the uh, Dwight Yoakam sound, which if you listen to any of Dwight Yoakam, Mark Chesnut records, I mean, Pete Anderson is the guy that's behind that sound. And I mean, it's not everybody or anybody that Pete Anderson will produce for. So, I mean, you must have felt really special, like the golden child when you yeah. suddenly realised Pete Anderson has plucked a young man all the way from County Down in Northern Ireland to come over to his studios and to produce yeah. his album. Well, it was such an honour for me. I couldn't believe it, you know, at the time. I just I could not believe it. And then they have him playing on the album as well, because he played quite a few of the instruments. Yeah, well, I mean, he plays, as you say, he's instrumental in Dwight Yoakam's recordings, a lot of other people's recordings. You know, he's got a very distinctive guitar sound. Great guitar sound, oh, really gutsy. I love, his, I love his guitar playing, and, and of course, that features on my album, you know, so I couldn't be happier. Now, now, also, there's another very, very special person on that album who plays steel guitar. Please share the story about this gentleman, because another, another wonderful person. Yeah, I mean, again, he's a fantastic steel player. I was lucky to have him, you know, play on, on, on my album. Uh, he's done various things over the years. Uh, recently, he was up for a, an Oscar nomination for his work on the film uh, Brokeback Mountain. Mm. Oh, tell us his name. Uh, it's uh, Boo Bernstein. Right. I mean, were you taken aback when Pete Anderson said, oh, by the way, Boo was going to be playing Steel on your album? Well, the thing that took me aback about this was just how humble these guys are. I mean, for all they've achieved and accomplished, they're just really down to earth, you know, lovely people. Mm. You know, and it was only, uh, I actually Googled him you know, on a scene, what, what he'd done, you know, he wouldn't even mention, you know, I've done this or I've done that, just very humble man. Right. Tell us what it was like for yourself being in the studio with these guys. I mean, again, as I said, everybody's been in studios, studio, musicians, but to be in a studio amongst the creme de la creme, I mean, what was it like? Was it a it very nerve wracking It was experience? daunting. I mean, we gathered in the studio and I was given an acoustic guitar and I was looking like Pete Anderson, you know, he's recorded Roy Orbison, he's recorded all these great singers. And I thought, you know, what am I doing here? But, you know, I sang and they were all very, you know, encouraged me and it was, it was nice. Was it a case, Tom, where you said, in a minute now, I'm going to wake up and this is all going to be a dream and I'm going to be yeah. really disappointed? Yeah, it was how, hard. how long did the actual process of recording the album with Pete Anderson and all the musicians take? It was, it was fairly quick. I mean, I was in LA for a couple of weeks. I think we spent about 10 days from start to finish. You know, that was starting, you know, it was, it was they work pretty quickly. Mm. And I mean, of course, like, I mean, on the album, you've got some cover versions and, of course, some of your original songs. I mean, tell us how the, the selection was done for the songs that appeared on this wonderful album. Well, because it's my debut album, I didn't want to do all originals. So I tried to, you know, some of my favourite country songs are on there. You know, it's just if someone picks up a CD, they don't know the artist and they don't know the songs. You know, I sort of put something on there, you know, that would give people, you know, something that An idea would of what encourage you them like. to listen to yeah. the album right. and then they could listen to my songs as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the title band for the album, which is one of your own song, The Devil's Playground, why did you choose that as the actual title for the album? Uh, it was just, again, it was, it was one of my own songs and I just thought it would make a good title for the, for the album. I mean, did, did Pete Anderson give you any idea what you, you know, how you would go about, you know, selecting material? Or uh, did he leave it all no, at your door? I mean, Pete, as I say, it happened pretty quickly, but he's just said, think of what you want to do. I, uh, I demoed the songs at home on my acoustic guitar and emailed them to Pete and he listened to them. 
and we, we selected out of that, you know. Mm. Now you're going to do a song for us uh, in a few minutes, which is the title band from the album, The Devil's Playground. T relate to the story behind that particular song, because it's a nice story. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it was actually a, a dear friend of mine uh, was going so, through some problems in, in his relationship. And, uh, you know, he'd lost a lot of weight and he was looking, he was looking in a bad way. And he, he confided in me one evening, you know, about what was happening within his relationship. And, you know, that he, he was keeping his relationship together for the sake of his children. And uh, it was a heartbreaking story and it inspired me to, to write the song. Because mm. you know? it's a, as I said before, it's a, it's a great song with a great storyline, which, as I said, you're going to uh, do for us in a few minutes. Now, Pete Anderson, I believe, after he finished this particular project, he's also offered to do your next album as well. Yeah, uh, we're going to be making an album of all originals. I mean, this album also has got two songs written by Pete. Pete is a great songwriter himself. So we're, we're working on doing a full album of original material. Right. Was it hard to get? Pete Anderson to give you a couple of his songs for the album, or did he give it well, to it them Pete quite freely? Yeah, Pete suggested, he said, I've got a couple of songs, and they are actually very good songs. I mean, the Mavericks have recorded Pete's songs, lots of people have recorded them. So to be given two songs from Pete was an honor as well. Yeah, and of course you do one of Dwight Yoakam's songs. Yeah, we do, uh, I mean, I'm a big Dwight Yoakam fan. And I hadn't actually planned, I was actually driving over to the studio, and uh, myself and my friend were talking, what about doing a Dwight song? And I said, well, I hadn't really planned it, but if I was going to do one, I'd do the distance between me and you. And we got into the studio, we were talking about what tracks, and Pete said, why don't you do the distance? So I said, yeah, Very eerie, that's what I was it? thinking. Oh. So we, we had to put it on there. And it, the, you can hear the, the uh, Pete Anderson guitar sound come through on that album, oh, can't I, you? I just love it. On that track you know, particularly, yeah, you know? Yeah, it's, it's brilliant. And you do a lovely, lovely song there, I'll Die Young. Yeah. Again, that was uh, a song I, I always thought was a great song, you know? Uh, so we thought we'd cover that one. I love the way you do the, that because you don't do it the same way as everybody else has done it. You, no. You've taken your own little twist on it, haven't you? Yeah, well, I don't see any point in trying to imitate anyone. You know, you've got to try and do it your own, your own version of a song. Right. Well, Tom, thank you so much indeed for coming in and seeing us here on the Irish Connection uh, Country Show. I really appreciate it. It's been great meeting you. Yeah. Great stories about uh, Pete Anderson. Absolutely wonderful. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Yeah. Well, thanks very much for having me on, Sean. Congratulations yeah, on your welcome. first anniversary. Love it. It's been great. Well, that's just about it for our uh, first anniversary, Sean. What a great show it's been. And uh, a big thank you to my special guests, of course, Cathy McGovern and, of course, Sean Harvey. And what better way to close the show than with Tom Keenan singing the title band from his uh, album called The Devil's Playground. Until we meet again, this is Sean Green saying thank you so much indeed for joining us. And please do come back next time and we'll do it all over again. Round. Sometimes it's easier to lie Facing the truth makes me cry So when she says she loves me I hold her close and smile but a part of me just died every time. Everyone says we make a lovely pair. And don't get me wrong, when she's on my arm, I'm happy she's there. They don't see the lonely nights She's out running around And I wait for her to return From the devil's playground The devil's playground Some night spot in town Where she slips off the ring my love don't mean a thing And the vows that we made They don't count at all 
It's all sad to see My angel fall should leave if I had any pride pack up my thing get on with my life but our little baby need me around I can't walk away Don't count at all. So sad to 